The following episode contains spoilers for Horizons of Spirit Island. If you are an individual who would prefer to avoid hearing any information about future content, I would recommend that you refrain from listening to this episode. This is your official spoiler warning. Breaking news! We interrupt this program with urgent developments, delivering the facts straight from the source. We turn it over now to Eric Royce, live at the scene. Thank you, Editing Ryan. I'm here today to tell you about new expansions. <laughs> and by the time you hear this, Greater Than Games will have released information already, but I'm going to start from scratch for two reasons. One is that not everybody may have heard anything which has been released, you know, so some people might not know anything about this yet. And also because we are speaking to you from the past, and I do not know exactly yet <laughs> what Greater Than Games is going to say. <laughs> right. And it's always possible that I might miss something which they don't cover if I don't start from ground zero. Right. So days right. that never were. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. We haven't even talked about our six player game yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what in <a> time. <laughs> so what we have is we have two new content based expansions coming out. Whoa. Oh. Yeah, we always knew that we were going to do one between Jagged Earth and the Dahan centric expansion I've been working on. And we were working on that when an unusual opportunity arose. So the one which we were working on is going to crowdfunding this fall. It's called Nature Incarnate. <gasps> and while we were working on Nature Incarnate, Target approached Greater Than Games about making a standalone expansion with... Target? Yeah, Target. Like the store? Yeah, like the big box store. Target? <laughs> indeed. <laughs> like indeed. where they have Starbucks? <laughs> yeah. This is like when Target... <laughs> releases her albums. How about that? So they approached Greater Than Games and about this and said, would this be a possibility? And Greater Than Games and I put our heads together and said, yes, this would be a possibility. It sounds really neat. <laughs> <laughs> so the prospect of having the game go through channels where other people could find it who wouldn't necessarily ordinarily find it was appealing. Mm. And Something which people have been asking for for a while is, you know, more lower complexity spirits. Oh. And some things about this oh. made that look like it would work. So it was like, yes, okay, we'll make a standalone expansion with all new lower complexity spirits. Also, it's at a much lower price point than the normal base game because a whole bunch of the components are simplified. And it also, the max player count is three. Anyhow, this standalone expansion is called Horizons of Spirit Island. And the thematic conceit is that there's the main island of Spirit Island, and then just like on the horizon in the distance, there's another island, which is close enough to Spirit Island that, you know, Dahan can travel to and from it without too much difficulty or danger from Ocean's Hungry Grasp. Yeah. Sort of in the same metaphysical bailiwick. There are spirits there, but there's different spirits who live there because it's a different place. It's its own place. So that's sort of the thematic conceit which I'm going for. This standalone expansion, it has, as of the time this episode airs, already been printed. And it should be in Target sometime around October 1st. Ooh. Mark your calendars, folks. Yep. And if you're going to Gen Con, go check out the Greater Than Games booth. They should hopefully have a copy or two, not for sale, but on display. Now, I mentioned Target. This is a Target exclusive thing for two years. So for two years, it's only available via Target. Now, Target's a North American chain, so this may make people who are outside North America unhappy. I just want to say this expansion would not exist if it were not for Target coming to us. Mm. It's not that we were developing content and then Target approached us and we said, yes, we will take some of this and hide it and lock it away for you. It was, no, this is genuinely new material which would never have happened if not for them approaching us. And once the exclusivity period is done, then we will be able to offer it through other venues as well. And in the meantime, there are reshipping services, which you can get it overseas. It's more annoying, for which I apologize. Mm. But it's awesome, and I'm super stoked that it's coming out. Pardon me while I go Google Gen Con event dates. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many questions right now. It kind of sounded like Archipelago in a fun way. So there's like Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition, mm -hmm. where oh. it's like kind of like Terraforming Mars, but it's a standalone expansion. Is this like that, or can you combine it? Or is this like only... Ares Expedition is not an expansion. <laughs> What that is, is it? A, that's a standalone game. Well, is, so is it kind of like this or no? No, Horizons of Spirit Island is basically the full game of Spirit Island. I say basically because it omits adversaries, it omits scenarios, it omits blight cards. 
So we're fine. <laughs> so you can't lose. <laughs> so Laura's like, we're fine. Hey, we're there's fine. no loss condition. So it is geared towards an audience which is probably less challenge seeking. The rule book for it does have like, okay, if you're looking for a greater challenge then these flag icons in the stage two cards, whenever those show up on each board at a town to a land without one, basically the Brandenburg Prussia escalation effect. Mm. And if you want further challenges, then go buy other Spirit Island stuff, which has adversaries and they get even harder. Huh. But it is the same rules. Like somebody who learns on Horizons of Spirit Island will be able to come into regular Spirit Island. Just you need to tell them how the blight card works and any adversaries you're using, and they should be all good. It's the same game. So it's just a different entry point. It's a different entry point, and it is also designed, in addition to being an entry point, it's designed to be a worthwhile expansion for existing players. Right, right. In trying to keep the price point down, Basically, except for presence discs, which are still wooden, everything which is wood or plastic in the normal base game is instead punch board. So you have punch board tokens for the cities and towns and Blight and Dahan oh. and all that. Hmm. There are no modular island boards. There is instead a single unified game board, oh. which has a two-player island on one side and a three-player island on the other side. Huh. And both sides also have areas for like fear and the Blight Pool and the Invader cards and all that stuff. Okay. You just have like a single board. <laughs> so there's a lot of these sort of efficiencies which provide a little less play variety for like somebody who's really into the game, but somebody who gets really into the game can then pick up the base game and get all the play variety they want. This is so cool. And that keeps the cost down. You sly dog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving this. Keep going, keep going. That keeps the cost down so that people who are buying it as an expansion for the spirits can then go, okay, like this isn't going to cost me an arm and a leg. You know, the base game MSRP is $90. Obviously, nobody wants to buy an expansion with five spirits for $90. Or if they do, it'll better have a lot of other awesome stuff too. Sure. But instead, the MSRP of Horizons is like $29.95. Wow. Oh, that's a lot better, yeah. Yeah, which is fantastic. Yeah. I hope they're making it up in volume because with today's shipping, I am really impressed they managed to get it down that low. Wow. Yeah. So this is Horizons of Spirit Island, which is going to be in Target on or around October 1st. The other expansion is called Spirit Island Nature Incarnate. It is not quite as imminent. So for now, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about Horizons. Here's a few quick facts about Nature Incarnate. It is not a Target exclusive. It is going through crowdfunding. It should hopefully be going to crowdfunding this fall. I believe that Greater Than Games will have announced a date for it by the time this episode airs. <laughs> <laughs> it will require Jagged Earth. That was the intent always once Jagged Earth came out, was that all future expansions would require Jagged Earth. The fact that Horizons of Spirit Island doesn't is because it's a standalone expansion. And Nature Incarnate is going to be a medium-sized expansion. It is not going to be as big as Jagged Earth or the base game, but it is going to be bigger than, say, Branch and Claw or Feather and Flame. Hmm, okay. Uh, sorry, I'm still thinking about Yeah, I don't care so, about Nature Incarnate right now. Yeah. <laughs> you said it didn't have Blight cards, nor scenarios, nor adversaries. Yep. For the Blight, is this back to the original rules? What was it, five Blight per player? Five Blight per player, plus one. Okay. okay. Oh, we're still back okay. to the plus one. Yep. We learned from our mistakes. Yes. So, but Fear cards are still a thing, Fear right? cards are totally still a thing. Are any of those new? So the spirits are all new. The rest of the materials are the same things as the base game. However, we've been trying to sort of do like sneak in little value adds for existing players. So we took the minor powers, major powers, and fear cards from the base game and updated wording to match the new nomenclature in Jagged Earth. Okay. Do you have an example? Okay. So one example, the land thrashes in furious pain. Hmm. In the base game, Hither 2, it has said, Two damage per blight in target land, plus one damage per blight in adjacent lands. And what that means is plus one damage in the target land equal to the number of blight in adjacent lands. But there's a fact because a number of people have had the confusion of like, wait, does this mean that it does damage in adjacent lands with the blight? So then the newly retemplated version says two damage per blight. For each blight in adjacent lands, one damage, parentheses, reminder text, in target land. Uh -huh. So that it kind of forestalls the fact question. There's a number of things like that where like things which are common fact questions get answered in italicized reminder text where it uses the standardized nomenclature of skipping an invader action instead of stuff like invaders do not build. Just things like that. Like, you know, it's not something which is necessarily strictly required, but it's nice to have. And if your base game cards are beginning to wear out, then you get those. Or if you want to pull the power progression cards for your base game spirits, 
out of your base game deck, then you can replace them with ones from Horizons and have a complete minor power deck plus the power progression cards on the side for teaching new players. I was wow. about to ask that. I was wow. like, are player progression things still a thing in this one? Great question. And are the corners still colored? So player progressions are a thing. The corners are not colored. However, I believe the intent is, and when I opened the preview copy that I got airshipped over, you know, I'm working off an actual copy here. Sure. All of the powers were in alphabetical order. And so there is also a booklet in it, which is not the rule book, but which is a quick start guide. And it tells you, okay, like for your first game, here's the island, you know, play these spirits, take the power progression cards, grab those cards out of the deck. They are not marked because you can just look at the name of the card and find it alphabetically. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Because what people love about Spirit Island is it's modular or how you can scale it difficulty wise. Mm -hmm. And I know this is like a boiled down or simpler version. Are you able to, even though there's no adversaries or blight cards, is a player able to scale the difficulty up or is there just one way to play Horizons? The difficulty scaling is you have your basic mode, which is equivalent to no adversary. You have your hard mode, which is equivalent to Brandenburg Prussia zero. And then after that, I can't remember, like the rulebook, I think briefly mentioned, if you want more challenge, just remove invader cards off the top of the deck. Mm. But the intent is like, if you like the game enough that you really want to start climbing difficulty, go buy the base game. Okay. The target as a standalone game for Horizons is not the same demographic as the target for the base game of Spirit Island normally. There's an overlap, certainly. Yeah. And some people will go, oh, Horizons is awesome. I want to continue on to the base game. Other people will just play Horizons and they'll play it at low difficulty and that will be fine. Yeah. I'm curious about this board. I want to hear more about that. Is it like a picture of A and B board? Uh, yes. Or are they just a copy of like other boards that are currently in existence is but just superimposed G? on a... <laughs> ah! So, yeah, yeah. Oh, that looks so cool! <laughs> Wow. Great, this is great content for a podcast. Yeah. It looks <laughs> cool. Oh, listeners, can you see it? <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is, indeed, it is two boards sort of the other side? smushed together, but it is not A and B, it is G and H. Oh! Three, ah! G! That was my next question! Yes! And the three-player side is F, G, and H. Wow. So That is crazy. Where's the double coastal wetlands? No. <laughs> Wait, can you hold that back up so I can print screen that? <laughs> Stay very still, Eric. <laughs> but again, I believe the Greater Than Games will have a copy on display at Gen Con, and so maybe they'll have the board up. I'm not sure. Oh, man. So I was literally <laughs> going to ask you, at some point, what are your machinations towards A, B, C, D, E, and then would there be more boards for future things just in general? Originally, the plan was no, but, well, plans change. So this is one reason why Greater Than Games doesn't speculate too much about what's coming down the pipe too far in the future, because sometimes we just don't know. Sure. Opportunities like this arise, or like, you know, the shipping crisis happens and it takes forever to get things. Mm -hmm. The further in the future you talk about what you're going to do, the more likely you are to be proven wrong. With the new board tiles, you know, as this game has gotten so popular, especially on digital or Steam, tabletop, you know, you can play up to six players, but a lot of time people play seven, eight players. Would you recommend if you were to play up to, you know, seven, eight, nine players to use that board, to use G and H? Oh. For the duration of target exclusivity, boards G and H will not exist in any other form. And the exclusivity window is two years, and that's far enough in advance. Okay. Okay. We know that there is demand for some of these horizons, like we've already had the questions, like, can you get a pack with just the spirits and nothing else? I'm sure there will also be questions. Can you get a pack with just the new boards and nothing else? And the answer to this is, we don't know. Okay. <laughs> That's two years in the future. We don't know. All we know is that you definitely won't be able to get it in the next two years. So that being said, if you have Horizons, you can absolutely play with the two or three player side in an archipelago with your modular boards. We love archipelago. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. I really love Archipelago for the purposes of mixing and matching different players whose skill levels are different. Mm -hmm. I find it really great to give the skilled player the more difficult job of being by themselves and then maybe have the newer players together a little bit. Have you ever seen a game that does like a handicap system? Yes. 
I don't mean to use the word handicap negatively, but just like, you know, an experienced player is not going to have the same amount of early cognitive blunders in understanding Mm -hmm. that perhaps a newer player may have because, oh, this is also new and whatnot. So I've really liked Archipelago for that. If you want to go one step further on that, it doesn't work for all adversary rules, but a whole bunch of adversary rules, you can say these apply on this islet, but not on that islet. Whoa. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's fun. So you can be like, okay, we're generally playing against France 2, but the France 3 effect, you get the extra towns from France 3. Yeah, this is so cool. Or the triangle trade from France 4 on this islet with the experienced players and not on the other one. Man, that's a great idea. Now, that's a little weird in that the fear deck. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. You know, you need to kind of figure out a fear deck, which is kind of partway between the two. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So it's a little bit of improvisation, but, you know, if you're not too out there, you know, it's definitely something you can mess around with. Did wow. did Tarkid say why? Like, not in a bad way, but did they hear about it, it or something? It does seem specific, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's like, did they see it on BGG? So if Bed, or... Bath, and Beyond comes up, <laughs> and they're like, hey. <laughs> Was there like, Tarkid has been having a more and more of a board game presence. No, they have. Yeah. They have. Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, like, they have all of Ravensburger. Seriously. We've got a lot of our, like, smaller board games from Target. Yeah, they have a lot of stuff there. I think they carry Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. I'm not sure on they that. They do? But yeah. They do. Which is I very that. similar. It's like an easier way to get out and play yep. Gloomhaven. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they're definitely, like, you know, interested in the board game space. I don't know the details of exactly when Spirit Island caught their eye or how, but I do know that it wasn't, like, out of the blue, one day, bam, they want to do this thing. It was, like, some time ago, I don't even remember when, Paula Greater Than Games mentioned... By the way, there's the outside chance that maybe someday something like this might maybe be a maybe thing. <laughs> so many maybe. <laughs> I'm like, okay, should I take any action on this? No. <laughs> you know, it's like, it was this sort of pie in the sky outside. Maybe a thing could happen someday. Sure. And sort of like, I can't even remember a timetable, but it just became more and more likely over time. And of course, it wasn't actually certain until Great of the Game signed the deal yeah. with Target. And I couldn't tell you exactly when that happened. Sure. I know that it was sometime after I was already working on it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's how we got the Princess Bride game as well as that Alien game was from them. Now, Jaws. Jaws is there. Like, the, there's yeah, the Jaws, yeah. board Jaws game. is there. Now, you said this was exclusive for two years, right? Yep. Meaning it's not going to be forever at Target. Correct. Yeah, no, it's exclusive for two years. Target doing exclusivity is, from what I understand, pretty standard. And it means, you know, they get to do it for a certain amount of time. They're the only channel which can carry the game. And after that, whether they continue to carry it will depend on their own internal business decisions, but it can be carried elsewhere. So you said that the various pieces would be punch board, correct? Yeah, except for the spirit presence tokens. Oh, and the presence tokens also are three different colors than in the base game. I was about to ask that too, yeah. Yeah, so you get a little bit there, you get three additional color options. Obviously, they don't have isolate reminders because isolate isn't in the base game. Sure. But there's sort of a burgundy, dark, purplish color in contrast to the lighter purple of the base right. game. There's a sort of teal, aqua, turquoise color. Eric, it is jewel tones. <laughs> that one's more sort of like mid-light. The yellow in the base game is a very, very bright yellow. There's more of a orange, yellow, sort of golden yellow. So these are new colors. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Like, I'm not sure that I'd play the new yellow alongside the existing yellow in the same game if they're too close to each other. Those two might get confusing. But, you know, in terms of just variety, it's great. And the purple and the sort of teal aqua are sufficiently different that I think that they'd go fine along outside of any of the other colors. I have been wanting aqua for so long. (laughs) And heck, even Ted said that that's one of his favorite colors, too. So I'm sure he's happy as well. Oh, that makes me so happy. Yay! Yes! But all the other things are punch board then, right? Yeah, all the other stuff is punch board. Interesting. If you want to try and kit out like a travel, a low volume version of Spirit Island, then like replacing half of your miniature cities with the punch board ones, they take up less volume. So you can save a little bit of space that way, especially because like the base game comes with enough cities to play four player games against England. Right. Well, almost, not quite. Hmm. But most of the time you don't need nearly that many. Have you played the game Axis and Allies? Long time ago. Because this, I think, has a very unique opportunity to lend a hand to a very specific problem that I think Axis and Allies handles very well. And that is component 
limited situations where we just had a six player game with Russia and we were running out of peeps to place on the board. Yep. So what we did is we took an energy token and placed it underneath a explorer, perhaps. Mm hmm. And the stack of energy tokens denoted the number of invaders and the piece on top denoted the specific kind invader. of invader that it is. Yeah. Because in Axis and Allies, they have that same system where it's a World yeah. War II combat game where you're using yeah. tanks, planes, artillery, <laughs> infantry, and they have white discs to denote just the number one, red discs to denote the number five. So if you see a red disc with a tank on it, that means five tanks. Yeah. So in the event that somehow you run out of Let's say France is going crazy. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry to the player who has to deal with <laughs> a France going crazy. But this sounds like it could be like, albeit maybe not the intent of the punch board, but could be a very unique use and like functional thing to have. Here are the punch board, which are two dimensional. Yep. And then you can just place whatever piece on top. Absolutely. Sorry. I'm just like, yeah. I'm thinking <laughs> of ways I can use this. Yeah. As For the someone... base game. Like right, you can well, include it. Yeah. I'm thinking of some way that I can use this even though I have everything that's ever come out up to this point, and it's still useful. Mm. That's awesome. The game comes with a handful, uh, half a dozen, I think, four, like not a huge number, but a few explore times three tokens. <laughs> what? So if you have like a huge land, then you can use those. Yeah, speaking of France. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's awesome. So, that's so brilliant. Dope. Yeah. Oh, one other sort of thing which is kind of useful is the form factor for target boxes is smaller. Yeah. yeah a lot smaller. Yeah. Than that of a standard game box. It's like, I don't know, 10 point something inches square instead of the nearly a foot square that hobby games tend to be. Yeah. But the box is still just big enough to hold an island board tip to tip. Okay. Which means that if you want to make oh. a travel kit, oh, oh, now, oh, you oh, cannot oh. fit all your spirit island content in here. Sure. But you can fit four island boards and the invader board and the cards and panels for like five regular spirits mm -hmm. plus the five horizon spirits because the horizon spirits aren't thick rigid punch board in order to save cost and save space they are card stock and so you can oh. fit those plus the others the other thing which i love about this i've actually been advocating for cardstock spirits to be an available extra for a long time sure. it means that if you have a storage solution like one of the big crates or the folded space inserts or whatever, then these spirit panels will fit in really easily. Right. Because all five together take up less thickness than a single spirit panel. Single one, yeah. Wow. Wow, that's clever. Yeah. yeah. This game keeps getting more playable. <laughs> yep. So yes, yeah, so you can make up a kit which has basically all of the material through Jagged Earth in terms of like power cards and fear cards and event cards, plus Five spirits, four boards, the invader board. You get like eh, two or three millimeters of lid lift, but not a huge amount. And enough towns and explorers. I think I used the punch board cities instead of the straight cities. But you can include the straight cities and only get a little bit more lid lift. Like basically you can kit out a two to four player travel kit if that's something that you do a lot. So if you play it mostly at home, don't bother with that. Well, I mean, both of us do a lot of teaching games where sometimes we do bring into other people's houses or something. So that is actually useful. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, you could do that. I've had to bring the Jagged Earth box, the Branch and Claw box, the Base box, all these boxes over for, like, a, a game in someone else's yeah. house. It can be a lot. Yep. Yeah, new expansions. Oh, man. I have the Broken Token insert, and I love it to death. It's so great. So it's a good problem to have, but it's like, oh, man, how am I going to fit everything together? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, that is a problem worth having. <laughs> yep. And speaking of thin panels, Greater Than Games is making thin panels for the existing spirits. What? So you'll be able to buy packs of basically travel panels so that you can save space in your storage solution. Huh. Nice. Or you know, make a travel kit. And because they are brilliant, they came up with the idea of also making them foiled for people who really like the fancy foil graphics. Oh, yes. Awesome. Yeah, so, like, foil graphics are awesome. I'm personally super excited because of the form factor. Like, when I was playtesting Jagged Earth, I'm like, I can fit everything in one box, except the spirit panels will make it difficult. Oh, no. And yeah, now it's yeah, like, aha. Quick. Yeah, now I'll be able to fit, you know, all 24 first wave spirits plus horizon spirits in, I don't know, like, what's this time six? Like, probably the thickness of, like, five or six normal spirit panels. Right, So right. So, like, super convenient. So I am stoked about that. 
as someone who has like all the foils for everything that ever came up for Sentinels of the Multiverse, I'm like, what did you say? <laughs> 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 did you say foils? <laughs> it's really funny. Like I've mentioned this to the playtesters and such, and some people's reaction was like, oh, that'll be so convenient for like bringing it to other people's houses, and other people are just like, foil, foil. Did you say foil? <laughs> foil. <laughs> so yeah, it's. Uh, Definitely appeals along two different axes. Can I be both? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Also, I'll say that like the cardstock spirit panels for Horizons are nice quality. You know, they are obviously less chunky than the spirit boards. They don't have that sort of heft in the hand. But you know, if I hold one by the long edge, the bend is maybe about an inch at the far side. And if I hold it by the short edge, it doesn't really bend much at all. And it flexes, it doesn't crimp when I bend it. I don't know if this is visible over Zoom, but the finish actually gives it a little bit deeper saturation than the normal spirit panels. So the graphics look really nice and rich on it. I'm really happy. That's basically the same consistency that I prefer my bacon to be at. <laughs> <laughs> Do not eat these spirit petals. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bend, but I don't want it to be like a yeah, like a piece of wood. <laughs> All right, so you're saying we can advertise Horizons as bacon-inspired spirit petals. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been working on two expansions at once. How was that process? So as a group, we were working on two expansions, but as an individual, I wasn't. And in order to explain this, let me back up a little bit. So when a board game designer signs a game with a publisher, then how much they're involved in the development of that game after the initial design can range widely. They can be completely uninvolved, 0%, or they can literally do all of it themselves and the publisher can do zero development work. The extremes are perhaps a little less common, but there's a very wide range. For the base game through Jagged Earth, I was probably up around like 80, 85% doing, you know, most of the development work. Ted and Christopher were invaluable as sounding boards and advisors, idea generators, moral support, all kinds of ways. They were just awesome and helping me out. But in the end, I was the one who was doing the work of running the playtesting, reading all the feedback, creating new iterations, figuring out what directions spirits and other materials were going, pushing all the stuff out to testers and making the development decisions, which was a lot of work. And Jagged Earth showed that this wasn't going to work long term in terms of sustainable development. And especially not if I wanted to do the kind of research and outreach and just investigation for a Dahan-centric expansion that I felt the expansion both deserved and needed. So for Nature Incarnate, the expansion which is coming to crowdfunding this fall, I did all of the initial design work. I created the initial things, but there is a team of folks, completely awesome folks, who have been working hard on the development of those materials for quite some time now. And I am ludicrously happy to be able to actually talk about this now because they have oh, been yes. fantastic. And I had to keep my mouth zipped about it because the dev process on Nature Incarnate was very quiet. Two of the names you'll probably recognize, Ted Vesness was on the show earlier this season, hey. is listed as lead developer for all of the preceding stuff. And Christopher Bedell is one of the founders of Greater Than Games. The other two are names you should know, who are veteran playtesters, they are veteran players, they have really great senses of analysis and collaboration, and have been fantastic to work with. There is Emilia Katari, who you may have seen online as Sakami, and Nicholas Real, who you may have seen online as Iron Eye. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Very glad now to finally be able to give them the awesome shout out from the rooftop of recognition that they deserve. Nice job, hey. all of you, nice job. And they have been driving the development of Nature Incarnate. They keep me in the loop, both because I'm sort of the primary thematic go-to for thematic questions. And they'll sometimes ask for my perspective on things. You know, they'll run stuff by me. And most of the time I'm like, that looks fantastic. Keep going. And when not, then we put our heads together and figure out where things should be going. And they're the ones doing this sort of like hard and wonderful work of synthesizing 70 million different opinions about how something plays into more concrete goals and plans of action to realize those goals and make iterations and what should we test next and where should things go on a week to week level. Mm. So. That's the backdrop of what was happening with Nature Incarnate, which was giving me the space to do work on the Dahan-centric stuff as the pandemic and political situation allowed, because it was a slow process to begin with, and the pandemic did not speed things up at all. Mm. And as I mentioned earlier, like Horizons didn't have a single 
poof, disappeared moment. It was more of a steadily, this seems more and more likely over time. So like in the summer of 2021, I spent some sort of daydream time on it just in case it became a thing. And then in September, the likelihood seemed a little higher. So I started doing brainstorming design work. And then like October last year, I was like, okay, it is time to put nose to the grindstone and start working on this stuff. And during that whole time, while I was focused on that, the dev team was still driving nature in credit. Mm. So both expansions were happening in parallel, but the attention was divided because we had planned ahead basically for this kind of attention splitting. Mm. And eventually playtesting did shift over to focus really intently on horizons for a few months because, you know, it was okay, this is high priority. But then after it was done, it shifted back to nature incarnate. Can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. Just about the intensive playtesting on horizons. Yeah. When you said they shifted over to that. Is that difficult for players? In the past, you've mentioned, like, if someone's used to 9, 10 difficulty as a playtester, and this Horizons is more meant for, like, base level difficulty, Mm. is that hard for them to judge, like, one, this is easy for some new to the game to understand, or two, this is underpowered, overpowered? No, for a couple of reasons. One is that we do have playtesters who play at lower levels of difficulty. Okay. In fact, the latest round of Call for Playtesters that I did a year or two ago was both to fix some demographic skews and also to fix some experience level skews. We had too many high experience testers and not enough lower experience testers. So it's a constant process because as people play more, they get more experienced. So that is one reason. The other is that the sort of playtesting group was the higher difficulty testers. They were running these spirits against high difficulty adversaries. You know, they were playtesting against level sixes. The new player stuff, In order to get this done in a timely fashion, we really did like divide and conquer. Christopher Bedell was just constantly running games with either completely new to Spirit Island players or I've only played this two or three times players Hmm. in order to act as a sounding board for is this an acceptable level of complexity? Because the Spirits, they're low complexity-ish, but they're not exactly analogous to the existing low complexity Spirits. And because of that, the entire time, we were very keenly aware, like, we need to make sure that these things will fly for new players. They're 2022 low complexities. (laughs) Ah, yes and no. Like, for example, none of them have Reclaim 1 on their tracks. Oh, River! (laughs) That's a step away. But they all have elements on their tracks. Whoa! (laughs) Which is something that none of the existing low complexity spirits do. Because testing revealed that was not a bridge too far. That was fine. Which is great. And Shadows is just weeping in the <laughs> corner. <laughs> I want my fire! <laughs> so yeah, all of them have a single, fairly straightforward and simple special rule. They all have a single innate power, which is very much in line with existing low-complexity spirits. Some of their innate powers key more off of three elements than two, because that, again, didn't prove to be too much of a stretch. Like, once the concept of an innate power and elemental thresholds is not much harder to grasp with three elements than with two. So that's why I say like low-ish, they don't map exactly into the box which existing low complexity spirits define, but they're in the same spiritual space, so to speak. Mm. Anyhow, so these spirits are low complexity, but just like the existing low complexity spirits, you can totally take them against high level adversaries. Okay. They will totally shine and they do some interesting things, which no other spirits do. Oh boy. I also am very happy that you get to finally talk about this. <laughs> yeah, I've been so excited to talk about all of this stuff. Like, I'm floored right now. I'm so excited that you put stuff on their tracks. <laughs> <laughs> really happy. So fun to get nifty well, gifties. I mean, people have been clamoring. And I mean clamoring because, I mean, people have been paying attention. People have been listening to all the various outlets where people have said, hey, pay attention for the next few months, even today. I'm not even being, like, metaphorical or hyperbolic. Literally today, right now, I'm looking at Discord messages saying, like, hey, where are we supposed to get something soon? On my account, Eric said something over the course of spring, and, oh, that means 11 days and whatnot. Obviously, they don't know that we're talking about this, but, like, I'm, no, oh, I'm just, <laughs> yeah, just like John said, I'm full of all the happies right now. This is so great. Well, we didn't know a whole lot, listener at home, going into this interview. <laughs> we, you know, so we're almost ready. Acting real time, just the same yeah. as the listener at home. Yeah, we know nothing about Horizons. Yeah. Nothing. Now, you said there were five. Five. Low complexities, right? Yes. Five. Now, I happen to notice that there are five 
areas that a spirit's powers are summarized with, with offense, control, defense, fear, and utility. There wouldn't happen to be any correlation to that, would there? Actually, no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I didn't think that so. Been cool. That would have been cool. <laughs> no, no. Fracture Junior. <laughs> <laughs> Just a splinter, not fracture. <laughs> this is splinter. Now, that said, it's actually a good chance to talk about something. I've talked in the past in a number of places about how making low complexity spirits is difficult. Yeah. And like when people ask for them, it would be like, why aren't you going to make more? And it's like, well, it turns out that's really hard. And the reason that we were able to make five in a fairly short span of time was there are a number of different factors which played into it. And one of them was that I, as a designer, gave myself permission to allow for some overlap in concept and in elements mm. and in role with the existing low complexity spirits because the design space for them is smaller than for the higher complexity spirits. Now, as it turned out, the overlap which there was, there ended up being less overlap than I had originally thought there was going to be, which is great. But giving myself that permission let me explore through areas of higher overlap and then find areas of lower overlap. But even so, like there's one spirit in here, Sunbright Whirlwind, which is very much a control-focused, pushing spirit, and you can draw parallels between it and River. I'm listening. In terms of, <laughs> it's a spirit which is primarily control. It's not great on fear. It has some offense and it has some good support. And, you know, it even has sun as one of its elements. So you can say, okay, yeah, you can see that there's some overlap with river. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But on the other side of things, it's also very, very different in how it does those things. Its present placement patterns are different. It has elements on its tracks. Its innate is rather different. Its special rule, instead of being about sacred sites, is just after you add presence during growth, push up to one explorer or Dahan from that land. Oh. Or Dahan. Oh. Yep, so you get explorer or Dahan movement in growth. Huh. Wow. I also like that it's up to one. Shadows, again, is crying. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Gather not up to one. <laughs> Just in case you don't want to push the thing, yeah. Yes, yes. Now, it can't do this every turn, because turns it reclaims, it's not placing any presence. And it's only placing one presence a turn on other turns, which is basically for balance reasons. If you can push too many explorers in early game, it's way overpowered. Hmm. So it is a control spirit like River, but the way in which it controls is different. It kind of feels like wildfire in a way. A little bit. Or just like presence does something. A little bit, yep. I can see that. Yeah. Oh, this also finally, like, people have been asking for wind spirit for ages. So we have a wind spirit now. We have a wind spirit! We have a wind spirit! <laughs> I love wind spirits! <laughs> you know, we had a wind spirit in an aspect, but as a primary wind spirit... Yeah, wind lightning, yeah. Dude, wind lightning. Where's that ice spirit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone's asking for the iceberg spirit to float on by the spirit island. That is not so likely. That spirit is river! <laughs> We've talked about this. River is the ice spirit you're looking for. <laughs> Another thing which made making lower complexity spirits feasible again was the fact that elements on presence tracks worked out because balancing spirits around without having elements on presence tracks and gating what the thresholds of the innates are going to be at what point in the game ends up being really tricky. You can see it in like lightning. The only reason that lightning can't rush six plays and hit max level innate is because it's constrained on energy and power cards. The only reason that River can't rush four plays and hit max in eight every turn is, oh wait, it can. <laughs> I was crafting the joke in my head for about three minutes from now, but you just took it from me. Oh, wait. Yeah, exactly. wait, it can. And has a reclaim one. Perfect. Yeah. So there's a particular dynamic. You can get around it, but it requires shenanigans like Lightning does, or where you aren't placing presence quickly enough, like, you know, Shadows, also early game, very, very starved for energy, so it can't afford to just crank plays. Mm -hmm. And unless you have a dynamic like that, which, as we've seen in Shadows, like, can be taken too far, and Earth gets around it by just having a generally cruddy plays track, like, it's slow to develop in that regard. Mm. But having elements on the tracks means you don't need to warp the design of the spirit around avoiding that dynamic of just plays rush, innate max level go. So. Those are sort of the big things. Also, just generally having more experience with the game also makes it easier. I have three questions that came to mind. Oh. Do all of these have a single innate? Yes. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the last time we saw low complexity peeps, you know, we didn't see elements on tracks, but we did see one and eight. I'm just curious yep, how absolutely. similar these similarities are. Yep. Two, right now I'm like gating which question has like importance in my head. So yes. Like, I'm curious for aspect potential mm. and the availability for various thematic exploration with various cool things. And the moment I see new spirits, I'm always like, will new spirits get new aspects? Because aspects are kind of awesome. I love aspects. I'm glad you enjoyed them. That's fantastic. I really love aspects. Did I mention last time I was on that, like, the concept for aspects came up before the core game was ever published? Really? I don't think so. Really? No, that was not. That was not mentioned. So I doodled around with the idea before, but it really sort of became something that I actively worked on at Origins. It was later in development, and we were trying to figure out what Shadow's special rules should be. Okay. Because Ted had raised the concern about being able to target any land with the Han creates a lot of search space, and like, you know, is there maybe something else? And so Christopher Bedell was running tests at Origins, and I talked to him. While he was running the tests, I came up with some notions for other ideas. And he ran the tests and he said, players really, really, really like this Dahan interaction with the special rule. So it's like, okay. So we decided to keep it. But while I was brainstorming for shadows, I'm like, I wonder if I could brainstorm other special rules for the other spirits. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And so I just like made this page of yeah. lists. I'm like, you know, we could do like little punch board overlays or something where you just yeah. swap out a special rule for a new thing that could like kind of, you know, give it, breathe new life into them. Huh. Well, that is a cool thing to think about if the game does well enough to ever merit it. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> and it did. Hooray! I had this conversation with John not long ago, and it was about the excitement for brand new spirits we've never seen before versus new incoming aspects. And I told him, I was like, honestly, I am almost equally excited for aspects as I am for new spirits. And one of the reasons why is because, yes, it's something new, but... It's so much fun for me anyway to see what's changed, what's kept, and what the aspect replaces, if any. And it's like this, oh, seeing what you're doing with this card to that spirit, seeing what they can become, because I know who they are already. And it's like, oh, now I can look at them in a completely different light. I was like, that is so much fun. Or at least I had a lot of enjoyment, and I still do, with the idea of, like, what else can we do with them? Like, the base version of a character... By the way, thoughts on calling spirits characters? Because we sometimes get flack for that. And I'm curious if you think that's, like, credible or not. <laughs> or if that annoys you as well. It doesn't reflexively annoy me. It's not something I've thought about deeply. It makes sense to me. I am troubled slightly when people refer to spirits as gods, because they are very deliberately not gods. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, back to my point. A spirit in its base form has, like, so much going on, and they're so intricately layered and designed that it's, like, it would almost feel like a shame that all this work and all this collection of time and thought and, like, thematic awesomeness stops there. Like, no, like, with what you said a long time ago with lightning, like, they are a spirit of air. Let's tease that out for funsies mm. in a cool way. What if they could do major powers? Well, we have immense lightning. But what if they were, like, super scary? Because, like, lightning and thunder, that's, like... Thunder and lightning aren't so frightening, but yes, they are. So there's pandemonium. Like, it's cool how you can tease these things out. And for me, I'm just speaking for myself here, because John thought I was weird when I said this in our conversation. I like new spirits. Aspects are cool, but I, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't disagree you did, with you. You did, but you really said, like it's aspects. It's so dope to see the new directions. It's like when a friend starts a new career, you're like, oh, you're like really cool because you know that person. You're perhaps, hopefully, invested in that person. It's just cool to see new directions, but with something that's familiar. It's like a little mix of both. But there's that puzzle of how are you going to make it work with a hand of cards that already exists? And how can you tweak this hand of cards that already exists to mean a completely different thing? Because with Pandemonium Lightning, it completely changes Harbingers, or at least, like, the value of having Harbingers. Yes. yeah. Because Harbingers, before, was like, okay, I have some Tahan control, but I'm primarily about busting buildings, but with myself and my innate power, which is awesome, Thunder Destruction. Not necessarily Tahan, I don't start with defend cards. But now, we have Pandemonium, which actually can defend. So, like, it's cool, or at least I always thought it was really cool how Lightning's aspects made various cards within Lightning's hand, in my opinion, more valuable, and so I think it's really cool to look at this kind of thing that can happen to spirits with the aspect cards. Thank you. That's one of the things I really like about them too. 
Ditto. <laughs> that was the audible equivalent of one person decking their house out at Christmas time with all the lights and all the things, and then the neighbor just has a sign that says "Ditto." Yep. Pointing <laughs> there. If the neighbor wants to do it right, they should put up a big mirror. Yes, I have the same light display as you. See. <laughs> <laughs> so, third thing with these new five peeps for Horizons, did anything from Spreading Rot make it into uh. these five? Asking for a friend. <laughs> uh, no, Spreading Rot did no! not influence any of them. Spreading Rot no! <laughs> That's fine, I'm a patient man. <laughs> I hate to break it to you, but Spreading Rot is not low complexity. Is not a good That's candidate true. for yeah, low complexity. Yeah, too many tokens, Ryan, too much I'm going on. I'm just asking for a little bit, just crumbs. <laughs> now, this is not to say there wasn't some cross-pollination insofar as... Ooh. These five spirits were not the only candidates. Like, the number of initial concept I came up with was large. The number of things which survived the first round of testing was medium. And you winnow down with the most promising concepts. One of the concepts for Horizons didn't end up making it to Horizons and instead is making it to Nature Incarnate. Oh, okay. Which is spreading rot. <laughs> <laughs> it is engulfing rot. <laughs> I have a question, kind of like tailing off of Ryan's question from a little bit ago, where Ryan asked, is each spirit one of the, like, summary of powers things? You said yeah. no. But I'm sure you weren't trying to, because you talked about this sun spirit, sun wind spirit mm-hmm. that is very controlling. And I'm sure you didn't want to make three other controlling spirits. So are there, like, different play styles with each of the five? Absolutely, yes. So now the other thing is that being lower complexity spirits, most of them have a fairly varied toolkit. Like most of them, I think all of them have some way of dealing damage. I believe all of them have at least some sort of control power. As usual, there's like the high interaction. And all of them have at least a tiny bit of fear generation. Sunbright Whirlwind doesn't have much. And most of them have some sort of either defend or skip a ravage or something along those lines. Like they're well-rounded and the more complex spirits sometimes aren't well-rounded. They're like, we are, you know, the one note chorus and we're just, you know, finder. Yeah. Control, control, and more control. Forget everything else. <laughs> but the lower complexity spirits have a more varied toolkit. That said, if you want, I can go over the names of the five spirits and sort of their approximate play <laughs> styles. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, none of them can use tokens, can they? Yeah, no, that's Branch and Claw and Jagged Earth. No, yeah, they're all base game. Okay, all right. So Sunbright Whirlwind, I've mentioned. It's primary air, secondary sun spirit. Okay. And it is very controlly. It is on the playful side. It enjoys hurling invaders into each other. Do you mind saying that once just a little bit slower? Because I missed it. Oh. The name of the spirit, sorry. Oh, Sunbright Whirlwind. So sun dash bright whirlwind. Gotcha. The highest offense spirit in the group is Devouring Teeth Lurk Underfoot. Whoa! <laughs> so, athlete's foot. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. No, more like... The original art design included... Oh, what type of shark was it? It was, like, based off of some weird type of shark that my younger child found in one of their books. They're really into sharks at the moment. And then the artist kind of took some stuff from, I think it was like lampreys or something, or these other things like sort of dangling tentacles. It has these giant teeth. It's big and teethy. And it is a steady presence placer. And it's boon I'm really pleased with. So you know about Flame's Fury is just Dragon Spirit. They get plus one damage with every power this turn. Devouring Teeth's boon is the Gift of Furious Might, which is the target spirit with one of its damage-dealing powers may deal plus three damage this turn. What? Yeah, wow. so... Wait, what? wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Slow, that's... Wow. Yep. All right. But just with one. But just with one. Yeah, but still, I mean, that gets around extra health. That gets around so much. It gives you the big, big chop. Now, it targets another spirit, so it's only for other folks, except in solo play. Sure. But that's okay, because your special rule is actually a form of damage boost. So, that's okay. Go on. (laughs) It's pretty simple. Just like, you know, your damage dealing powers do plus one damage. That's all. Whoa! (laughs) So, it's just like you have a permanent Flames Fury on yourself. (laughs) That is so cool! There's Eyes Watch from the Trees, which oh, is... Sounds creepy. Yep, fear and defense. So my story on this one. So on a thematic level, these are spirits which literally live within the trees. Oh, they look like bats. Yeah. I think I've seen that out of a Jungle Book cartoon or something like that. They're <laughs> Maybe eyes. not bats, but they're just like eyes inside of a tree hole. Yeah, yeah. little squirrels with big eyes. You know those rotted out holes you see in trees, which are, you know, in darkness? Yep. It's just eyes in there. 
And thematically, in universe, if you go up to the holes and you look inside, you won't be able to see anything. It will be an empty hole. Right. They're only there when they want to be. The vibe I was going for was something which, if you know what they are, they're kind of friendly and cute looking. And if you don't know what they are, they're kind of unsettling and creepy. Kind of a vaguely, almost a Studio Ghibli direction. They do a really good job of having things which are creepy when you don't know what they are. But once you know what they are, they've kind of become friendly. They're really good at doing that. So that was kind of the thematic direction I was going for because these spirits have a good relationship with the Dahan. For the first few generations after the Dahan showed up on Spirit Island, you know, they were like, oh God, eyes, trees, stay away. But eventually, <laughs> yeah, yeah. over the generations, they were like, wait, wait, actually, like these susurrating whispers which are coming out of the trees, which are creepy as heck. If you listen carefully, you can actually understand them maybe. Whoa. And they're actually telling us useful stuff. Okay, this is great. So the special rule on eyes watch from the trees is that the Dahan trust them, and the eyes act as watchers and scouts for the Dahan. Whenever eyes watch from the trees uses a defend power, afterwards they can gather a Dahan into that land. Mm. Oh. Mm, that's huge. Oh. That's huge. Huge for counterattacks. Oh, that's cool. Huge for counterattacks, and also for saving individual Dahan, who you might otherwise be like, oh, I really want to save them, but I don't have the card play to be able to save them. This way is like, oh, I get incidental the Hong movement as part of playing defend. So a question about, you know, this is a fear defense spirit. Yeah. So like many minds is also like a fear defense spirit, but it kind of makes sense where it's like a flock of wasps is like making me not be able to ravage the land. Mm -hmm. How does like this thematically work for these like little critters and trees to defend the land? Oh, mischief and sabotage is the name of their innate power. Okay. They are sort of a version of the prototypical meddling spirits which mess around with your habitation. Mm and get in the way of all manner of things. And it's not the grand scale arson of Trickster or anything like that. Kind of reminded me of that, yeah. Yeah. But it's just everything constantly going wrong. Yeah. So the innate power starts off with fairly low levels of defense, but then as you increase in elemental thresholds, the defense goes higher and higher, as does the fear. Okay. It's almost like Spirit Island Jawas. Huh. Like <laughs> Jawas? The eyes, well, like the eyes coming from Ooh, darkness. Teeny. <laughs> but they're kind of mischievous, yeah. you know, kind of helpful sometimes. The initial sketches for the art on this, I was like, huh, okay, this needs a little tweaking. And the playtest group told me, no, do not use this art. I'm like, really? Why? They're like, it is nightmare fuel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? That's scary. You need revision. I'm like, okay. Okay. All right. I'll go back and revise. We did a number of revisions. There were a variety of reasons that it parsed as like tremendously creepy and terrifying. Instead of natural looking holes, the holes in the trees looked more like jagged rents. And the eyes were just like densely clustered and varying in size in a way which there's apparently an instinctive reaction. It might be a phobia, I'm not sure, which some folks have it with dots of varying size clustered closely together, this sort of instinctive revulsion reaction. Hmm. And the initial art on this definitely could have triggered that. So we tried to tone that down as well. Interesting. And it hit a point where I'm really pleased with it. When you look at it, you feel like, oh, it's something I can empathize with. I can imagine being this spirit and not feel like I'm evil or something. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like if this was outside my window and I didn't know what it was, I would be creeped yeah. back out. Like, you know, <laughs> there's something watching me. And right. some of those eyes are in pairs and some of them are solo. What has single eyes? Why is it watching me? <laughs> I don't know. That's like the creepiest. At least they're not red eyes. Red eyes are creepy. <laughs> Do you like go back to the artist and say like, draw something less creepy or something? Oh yeah, no, art always, especially for the initial concept on spirits. There's an initial sketch concept. Okay. Oftentimes several different like, which way would you rather I go? So sure. yeah, it's always iterative. I'm getting like such dark and tangled wood vibes from this. Creepy, but also defense as well. Yep. Dark and Tangled Woods has two of its primary three elements. It is being trees, its primary plant. That's what I was thinking, yeah. And then it has secondaries of moon and air. Makes sense. So. Makes sense. Thematically, that's very appropriate. Oh, I forgot to mention, elemental portfolio of devouring teeth is animal primary with fire and then followed by earth. Fire makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Fire for the aggression, the yeah. Yeah, yeah. devouring. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So we have two more. There is Fathomless Mud of the Swamp. Sucking ooze. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is perfectly on element for it. Nice. You already found the ultimate. And it's interesting. So Sucking Ooze gives isolate. And so like a mud spirit, mud should totally be isolate, right? Yeah. It absolutely is isolate. 
But this is base game. There is no isolate. Sure. Yeah. So, How do you do that? So for a long time, what happened was I had angst and kind of like walked around in circles and was really unhappy about it. And then explored, could we maybe like do a shortened version of isolate as a special rule, like in lands with your sacred sites, skip explore actions and don't count buildings for exploring, but no, a bridge too far complexity wise. Okay. Hmm. But eventually came up with something. At your sacred sites, build actions at explorers instead of towns and cities. Oh, so you're that not makes getting any sense. you're not getting buildings. Huh. So you no. can't build on mud. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. You can still have some population, but you can't have huge population because sank into the swamp. Burned over, fell down, sank into the swamp, you know. Yeah. Foundations oh, huh. sink into mud. <laughs> <laughs> and so you don't get an immediate isolate effect. Fathomless Mud, over the course of a game, is capable of making clear zones much better than many other spirits because it can stop buildings from coming in in key locations. Did you say it was on sacred sites? Yes. Huh. Sorry, I'm just like thinking of... Yeah, thinking through all the ramifications, yes. Wild's tokens wouldn't do anything here, would they? Since Wild's tokens prevented explore actions, but never explorers. Yep. Likewise, isolation wouldn't prevent anything either, since it only prevented adjacencies at the player's behest, but I never stopped build actions. So, if you're playing as Fathomless Mud, and you have a sacred site, and there's a Wild's token on that sacred site, if they build there while having an invader piece in that land, an explorer would appear, and the Wild's token would stay? Yes. Is this a double-placing presence spirit? One of its options does double place presence. It has both a tool and a tension, which is that its innate power targets from a sacred site, and it moves one presence from the origin sacred site to the target land. Mandatory. It oozes outwards. Sure. Uh, okay. It spreads. And this is, in some ways, it is a cost, because you end up often breaking up the sacred site in the origin land. Right. But depending on how it's used, it can also be a benefit, because it can let you form a sacred site. Make a new one. In the target land. So for beginning players, it mostly is just something that happens and they roll with it. Like, they don't need to think about it too much. <laughs> but for an experienced player, there's some really interesting decisions and trade-offs to be made. Hmm. And this is one of those cases where Christopher's work with beginning players was crucial to establish that this is not too complex. Fathomless Mud is one of, I think, two spirits which can move their presence in some way or another. Mm. The last spirit I haven't talked about has one of its uniques which moves its presence. I mean, that can sound scary, too. If you're stuck in mud or you're even sinking in it, like, does this spirit generate fear as well? Yeah, its summary of powers is pretty well-rounded. It's a touch higher on fear and defense, but it's pretty even across the board. But yes. I like your all trades. Yeah. Yeah. So Fathomless Mud, I'm very pleased with. I'm pleased with all of them, honestly. They all do things which no other spirit has done. And the last one is Rising Heat of Stone and Sand. Oh, 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 is this a dedicated desert spirit? It is not dedicated the way Volcano is. That would not be low complexity. It's not you can only go into sands. But it does have a double presence growth, which only goes into mountain and sands. Okay. Oh, nice. Both of them. So you have a much easier time getting into mountain and sands. Sure. Which is relevant because at its sacred sites, invaders have one less health. Whoa. Oh. Yep. Whoa. All things weaken? Effectively. When it's hot enough, everything weakens. <laughs> <laughs> Do you blame me for having my mind immediately go to mist? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Not even kidding. Yep. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> yep. Oh, look, here comes the nice, cool, refreshing mist. Why are we dying? <laughs> <laughs> Why am I dying? Wow, okay. These are cool. So, yeah, Rising Heat is primary fire, obviously, but then has sure. secondaries of air and earth in a very interesting intertwining. I'll wait until it's actually out to talk about the full story. Sure. But suffice it to say that its first two thresholds on its innate, the first is two fire, two air. The second one is three fire to earth. Wait, oh. Okay. So you could trigger either, one. Either one. Either depending. one or one or the other. Yes, exactly. One or the other, but not necessarily both in the same turn. Again, this is an area where, like, that's not something I would have felt comfortable doing without somebody just hammering on new player experience testing to make sure that that would go okay. Okay. And it turns out, yeah, it does. And not only that, it turns out that, like, it teaches newer players you execute each line which you match in order which is a question which always comes up because it's not really relevant for many of the existing low-complexity spirits. So, wow. 
Yeah, it does neat things. It is the second highest offense spirit in the game, just because like it does have damage of its own, but also acts as a damage enabler for anybody else in the game. Yeah, I like that. I like the enabling. Yeah. It's fun. Let's see. Any other tidbits? Oh, I failed to mention on elements that while Fathomless Mud's primary elements are water followed by moon and earth that it also does towards the upper and it has on its power cards it has some plant and its upper level innate has a splash of plant because swamps are very fertile places yeah this is not a fertility swamp spirit there could be a different swamp spirit which is like blooming flora of the muddy ground or something along those lines probably a better name than that which is more focused on the plant life and sort of flourishing of the swamp. Mm -hmm. This is really mostly about the ooze and the mud. So you mentioned that, uh, what's it called? Uh, the mud, the fathomless mud. Sorry, I'm still learning all these yeah. spirits. Oh, yeah, totally. You mentioned earth as like one of the primary elements. A lot of earth spirits can always place presence, which is really cool for vital strength of the earth. Yep. Because as we talked about, you're always growing, even if you reclaim looping. Is that a similar mechanic that you have here? Yeah, both for sort of earth thematic reasons and because otherwise reclaim turns on Fathomless Mud become too high stakes because they always want to have at least one sacred site on the board. Yeah. Because they're innate targets from a sacred site, but the movement from their innate can break up the sacred site. Now, experienced players can work around this without trouble, but we want this to work well for new players. Right. And so we wanted to make sure that there's always the ability to create a sacred site, even if you don't already have one. And so all three of its growth options can place presence. Oh, that's something else which is common to all of them. All of them have pick one growth out of three options. That was my next question. Yep. Okay. Yep. Oh, I have Indeed. a question. Yeah. So all of the low complexity spirits from the base yep. game, they all had a support power. It's so like lightning had the boon of vigor. Yep. Uh Mantle of Dread, or the Gift of Strength for one of them. Yep. Do these new characters all have a support power as well? Four of the five of them have a support power, and Sunbright Whirlwind has two. Ooh. Wow. Nice. <laughs> well done, Whirlwind. Is there a reason why you like to do that with the low complexities? Say, like, so Fangs or Thunderspeaker, they don't have any support powers. But for low complexities, you seem to always put some type of boon or a gifting power. In general, I like it if most spirits can have one. There are some who don't. Those tend to be spirits which are very wrapped up in their own thing to the point where they almost ignore that other spirits exist. And <laughs> like Thunderspeaker is kind of that way because it's so focused on the Dahan because of its oath. Sharp Fangs is more that way just because that's how the design and development shook out, but it isn't discordant thematically with its nature. It is something of a pack hunter among its own kind, but it's not really like a big collaborator with other spirits. It's like very much concerned with its own bailiwick. Mm -hmm. A lone wolf, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Do you mind just saying for the record and just for my own cognitive recall the names of each of them again? Sure, yeah. Going in alphabetical order, we have Devouring Teeth Lurk Underfoot, Eyes watch from the trees, fathomless mud of the swamp, rising heat of stone and sand, and sun bright whirlwind. Thank you so much, Eric. This has been incredible. Our <laughs> brains are so melted. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um. Thank you, sir. Have another. Yeah, that was a bomb. That, <laughs> really, it yeah. really was. That is so I know exciting. I got the email about the Horizon stuff back in December or whatever, but then I totally forgot, and I had no idea about all the other Target stuff, and that it was, like, the intentionality behind yep. it, and yeah. how it was all going to come together. The fact that it was Target, like, most things we share with playtesters, but that detail we did not share with playtesters until, I think, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, because that was one of those things where, like, high, high confidentiality. Yeah. Right. So they were the third party that you spoke of nebulously. Yep. When we were getting this interview ready, you're like, yeah, yep. third party stuff. I'm like, okay. Yeah, I totally <laughs> missed that. <laughs> well, Eric, I'm not sure what to say with all this new stuff. I have so much to think about. This is so dope. I think a lot of people right now have a lot to process. <laughs> so th a lot. This has been an awesome episode. Thanks for coming on, Eric. Thanks so much for having me. I'll warn, like, you know, wait until you see the rest of each spirit before you start trying to chess out openings for them. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, people have already started, I can tell. I think you'll find a lot to like. <laughs> wow. Yeah, just thank you in abundance, seriously. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so glad for all of our sakes, most of all yours, that we can finally speak to, well, this. 
<laughs> Thank you so much for having me on and allowing me to be volubly enthusiastic about this stuff I've had to sit on for so long. Thank you also for all the podcasting. It's fantastic to listen to you. Hooray. Oh, that's awesome. That means Yay. more than you know. <laughs> because it's a lot of work. <laughs> anyway, it is Fern with Midnight. So we will catch you all on the Flippity Flip. Peace out. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We want to extend a heartfelt thank you to Eric for once again spending some time with us and joining us on the show. We hope you're as excited for Horizons as much as we are. So, now that we've talked about Horizons, we're going to get back to the normal release schedule, with the lightning survey as the next episode. As it is three and a half hours long before editing, I'm fairly certain it'll take me two weeks to get it done, but we'll see. The sound levels were kind of weird on that one, I don't know why. Somebody take me a minute to kind of balance that all out. Anyway, my goal is to have it ready to rock by August 13th. That's what I'm aiming for. Okay, until next time, later! <laughs>